Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to discuss the anatomy and the physiology of the stomach. So in the first part, we're going to identify some of the important anatomical features. And after we've covered that, we'll go into how the stomach actually functions. So let's do a very, very brief recap of what we covered in the previous video. We talked about how food enters the body, which is, of course, through the mouth. And we also mentioned how the teeth the tongue and also salivary glands perform a mixture of mechanical and chemical digestion of that food. And whenever we swallow that food, the food moves through the pharynx and then ultimately into the esophagus, which is where we concluded the previous video. Now remember, it's the peristaltic contractions or peristalsis that's caused by these smooth muscle cells in the wall of the esophagus that move the food, which is now called a bolus, unidirectionally down the esophagus, and ultimately that bolus of food is going to wind up in the stomach. And where we ended this video is we mentioned that that bolus of food is going to have to pass through this structure called the lower esophageal sphincter. Now, as we're going to see in this video relating to the stomach, it has another name called the cardiac sphincter. We'll talk about why it's called that in a minute. But this lower esophageal sphincter is going to regulate the passage of the bolus from the esophagus into the stomach. Now, why would we want to regulate that process? It just seems pretty straightforward, right? It's going to move from the esophagus into the stomach. Well, under normal conditions, we want this passage to be unidirectional. We want that bolus to move only from the esophagus down into the stomach. We don't want the contents of the stomach moving backward into the esophagus. Now, under some conditions, as we mentioned, that does happen, such as acid reflux, which is not normal, or if we were forced to vomit something up. But under normal digestive conditions, we want this flow to be one way. And so the lower esophageal sphincter is going to regulate that and allow passage of that bolus into the stomach. So now let's talk about the anatomy of the stomach. So this right here is the distal part of the esophagus, or we could say the lower part of the esophagus. So right here, this is the location of the lower esophageal sphincter. The other name for this is the cardiac sphincter, and that naming has to do with the fact that the region right here of the stomach, this initial part where the bolus of food enters the stomach, this is called the cardiac part, or the cardia of the stomach. Okay. If we go up here to the top of the stomach, this rounded area right here, this region of the stomach is called the fundus. Okay. Now underneath the fundus, all this kind of going over here, this bigger region over here that kind of lies between what we call the lesser curvature and the greater curvature, all this is the body of the stomach. Okay. And then the remaining part over here in this region, this is what we call the pyloric region or the pylorus. Okay. Now, if we look at the stomach, there's obviously a curvature up here on top that kind of lies between the cardia and the pylorus. This would be the lesser curvature. And then this much larger curve right here that's the inferior one, so to speak, this is the greater curvature of the stomach. Now, with the pyloric part, or the pylorus, which is just this general region right here, we have two major parts. We have the pyloric antrum, which is actually the component that actually uh, intersects with the body of the stomach. And then as we go toward the pyloric canal, we see the stomach getting narrower and narrower until we essentially hit what's called the pyloric sphincter. Okay? So while the cardiac sphincter, or as we call it, the lower esophageal sphincter, regulates the flow of the bolus from the esophagus into the stomach, the pyloric sphincter regulates the flow of contents of the stomach into this, which is the duodenum, or the first part of the small intestine, which we're going to cover in the next video. Okay? Now, one important thing about the contents of the stomach, it's no longer called a bolus. A bolus is really what it's called in the esophagus and initially when it enters the stomach. However, in the stomach, we're going to see we'll have a lot of chemical and mechanical digestion, and it's going to become this more liquidy fluid, which we then call chyme. And so if we wanted to be very specific, the pyloric sphincter is going to regulate the flow of that chyme from the stomach into the small intestine, specifically the duodenum. Okay? And again, this pyloric sphincter is very important in that regulation because we want the flow of the chyme in the stomach to be unidirectional. We don't want the contents of the small intestine flowing back into the stomach. We only want the chyme to be 
moving into the small intestine, and we don't want it to happen all the time. We won't only want it to happen at certain times, particularly after this digestion has been completed in the stomach. Okay, now you also see here these rugae. So if you look on the inside of the stomach, you'll see these folds. You see all these lines. They look like wrinkles on the interior of the stomach. This is on the stomach lining. Okay, These rugae are actually folds that allow the stomach to expand once it's actually filled with food, okay, which we would then call chyme, correct? And so if we were to imagine kind of extending or expanding the stomach out, the rugae would essentially disappear because we're expanding the stomach. And so these rugae are really just a result of the fact that the stomach at baseline is sort of compressed and it kind of causes these wrinkles, but they allow it to expand once the stomach fills with food, okay? Now a couple other things I want to mention about the stomach that involve mechanical digestion are we have muscular layers inside uh, the walls of the stomach. Now I know I didn't box these muscular layers over here, but what you should know about each segment of the GI tract, that is the esophagus, stomach, small and large intestines, is that they have a muscular layer in their wall. And pretty much every one of these has a longitudinal muscle layer and a circular muscle layer except for the stomach, which actually has a third muscular layer. So the, the third muscular layer, which is the oblique muscle layer, is going to allow the stomach to have even stronger mechanical digestion properties. Okay? And really what each one of these terms means, that is longitudinal, circular, and oblique, these mean that the striations of these muscle layers are going to be in different planes. Okay, so for example, the longitudinal muscle layer, those striations or those muscle fibers are going to be in the longitudinal direction. In the circular layer, they're going to be in the transverse direction, which is perpendicular to the longitudinal layer. And then the oblique layer is going to run diagonally to both of these. And ultimately, what having three layers of muscle tissue all in different planes is going to allow is the, mu the stomach to contract its smooth muscle and perform peristalsis in more directions. And ultimately that means that the mechanical digestion is going to be very strong in the stomach. Now these muscular layers allow mechanical digestion, okay? But when we start talking about chemical digestion, we're starting to get into the physiology of the stomach. Okay, so again, remember the food as a bolus is going to come from the esophagus, enter the cardiac sphincter, and ultimately end up in the stomach. Now, other than mechanical digestion, we know that there's a lot, a lot of chemical digestion in the stomach. And to really understand the chemical digestion, we have to talk about three cell types that exist in the wall of the stomach. Okay, these are G cells parietal cells, and chief cells. The first one we're going to talk about is this G cell. And the G comes from the fact that this cell secretes a hormone into the blood called gastrin. So let's imagine that this bolus of food comes into the stomach. Well, as more and more of that bolus, more food comes into the stomach, you imagine that that's going to cause the stomach to stretch because it's going to have to fill with that bolus of food. And so whenever the walls of the stomach stretch, that's going to stimulate G cells to release a hormone called gastrin into the blood. Okay? So really what gastrin does, among other things, is gastrin is going to stimulate this other cell type called a parietal cell to start making more hydrochloric acid. Okay? So when we think of the acid of the stomach that helps denature proteins in the stomach, that's hydrochloric acid very, very acidic. When, after you consume a meal, your, the pH of your stomach acid actually is going to fall to about one or two. That's extremely acidic. Okay? So the parietal cells are going to generate that hydrochloric acid, and part of the stimulus is going to be the gastrin that's released from the G cell that is, again, released in response to stretching of the stomach wall. Okay? Now, the parietal cells will also release hydrochloric acid in response to another stimulus, and that is just simply conscious thought. So sometimes when you're hungry and you're thinking about food, even if you haven't consumed food yet, you'll hear that rumbling in your stomach. That's because conscious thought is actually able to stimulate the parietal cells to start releasing hydrochloric acid in preparation for consuming food. Because theoretically, if you start thinking about food, there a lot of times is going to be food present in the near future. Okay? And actually that conscious thought that's stimulating the parietal cells, it's actually directly through the vagus nerve, which is cranial nerve number 10.
Okay, so both conscious thought through the vagus nerve and gastrin can actually stimulate the parietal cells to release HCL. We're going to talk more about the function of HCL on the next slide. The other thing that's going to happen is the chief cells, um, also under the control of gastrin, are going to release this enzyme called pepsinogen. Now, pepsinogen is inactive. Okay? Whenever you see this suffix right here that says ogen, that's a clue that you've actually got an inactive enzyme. And the reason that we secrete pepsinogen as an inactive enzyme is because if we don't have any food in the stomach to digest, then it doesn't make sense to have an active enzyme. However, once food enters the stomach and we get this gastrin that's released by the G cells, gastrin stimulates the parietal cells to release HCL. And it is the HCL that activates pepsinogen. Okay, so I have this reaction shown right here. We'll look at it in more detail on the next slide. But essentially, whenever the stomach becomes more acidic, that actually activates pepsinogen into pepsin. So it turns out that at higher pHs, pepsinogen is inactive. However, when the parietal cells start generating HCL, the pH of the stomach drops. And that drop in pH is what activates pepsinogen to pepsin. And presumably, if we've got that HCL in the stomach, that means we've got food in the stomach, or food's going to be coming very soon. And so if food's going to be in the stomach, or already is, then it makes sense to have pepsinogen activated to pepsin. Okay? And really, it's the HCL which denatures the proteins, and active pepsin, which actually breaks down the proteins, that's what the chemical digestion in the stomach is doing. Okay? And as you digest that, that food more and more, it turns into a very thick liquidy substance, which we call chyme. Okay? And then at some point when the chyme has been fully digested, at least from the stomach's point of view, it will be squirted through the pyloric sphincter into the duodenum of the small intestine. And we'll cover the small intestine physiology, which is very complicated, in the next set of videos. But before we actually conclude this video, I want to talk in more detail about what's really going on in the stomach. And there are some terms that can be kind of difficult to understand. And that is the concept of denaturation of proteins versus digestion of proteins or breakdown of proteins. What's the difference between protein denaturation and protein breakdown? So denaturation is a function of the acid in the stomach. Okay? You can take a protein just in a test tube put it in concentrated acid and the protein will denature. So what does that mean? Well, we get a dietary protein, that is a protein from the diet, let's say from a steak or something, and normally it'll kind of look like this. It's a folded protein, okay? It turns out that a folded protein is difficult for enzymes to kind of break down because it's all compact like this. So in order to make it easier for the enzymes to break this protein down, that acid that's released from the, the parietal cells of the stomach denatures this protein. And literally what that means is that protein becomes unfolded. You can imagine that if an enzyme is trying to attack a certain part of this protein, it'll be easier to do it when it's unfolded. There's less things blocking it, right? So HCL's function is literally just to denature the protein, okay? And these, of course, are the proteins that we want to break down. These are the dietary proteins. Now again, the other thing that HCL does, remember, is it activates this enzyme pepsinogen into pepsin. So pepsin is going to be an enzyme that's actually going to break this dietary protein down. So HCL only denatures this protein. The enzyme pepsin is going to break it down into little peptides or just simple amino acids. So here's an example down here. Let's say this is a dietary protein that's been denatured by hydrochloric acid. Okay? And each one of these squares represents an amino acid. So the job of pepsin is to break that protein down into smaller peptides and then just simple amino acids. So here I've broken this peptide bond right here. That gives me the red and the blue amino acid as a small peptide. And then I've broken it also right here between the green and the orange one. So that gives me a purple, red, and green tripeptide. And then, of course, just a simple amino acid. Okay. The point is, is that pepsin, once activated by the stomach acid, is going to be able to break dietary proteins down into smaller peptides and just single amino acids. And the reason this is important is because once the chyme is squirted into the small intestine, 
these amino acids that are just single amino acids can be directly absorbed into the blood and also it's easier for the small intestine to then break down these tripeptides and dipeptides further okay because the small intestine it turns out can really only absorb single amino acids or very very small peptides such as dipeptides or tripeptides okay so hopefully this makes sense so let's do a very brief recap of the physiology Remember, when a bolus of food comes from the esophagus into the stomach, that causes the walls of the stomach to stretch, which triggers the G cells to release gastrin, a hormone, into the blood. The gastrin will do a number of things, but one of the things it does is it stimulates the parietal cells in the stomach to release hydrochloric acid into the lumen of the stomach. Okay? Also, conscious thought via the vagus nerve can also activate these parietal cells to release HCL. Now, the chief cells are kind of always releasing pepsinogen and keeping inactive pepsinogen in the blood. However, that hydrochloric acid will activate pepsinogen into pepsin, and the hydrochloric acid will denature dietary proteins into an unfolded state, which makes activated pepsin have an easier time breaking down these proteins, like this, into small peptides and amino acids. And really, once all this is complete, the chyme, which is the resulting substance from the breakdown of all this stuff, will be squirted into the small intestine. Okay? And the small intestine is where we're going to pick up in the next video. So we're actually going to look at its anatomy first and a little bit of its physiology. We're going to see it's a little bit more complicated than the stomach, so we're going to cover the small intestine in a, in a couple or several videos. So please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.